But you're Jewish. Right. Are you Jewish Italian? No, I'm just plain Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> well, how does that work? Tell me how that, 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 kind of, that happens. Jews and Italians are very similar. It was like my husband and I were from this, brought up in the same house. So, they're, you know, they're, the family life was the same. Does that mean you're, you're, okay, so your husband, is that your husband's last name? Yeah. Okay, so was he Catholic? Yes. So Tell how did that, that work with you being a Jew and him being a Catholic? It worked out fine. I always felt religion was a personal thing anyway. But uh, he was, he acted very Jewish. And he was really interested. I would never have asked him to convert because his mother was still alive, you know. And I wouldn't have done that to her. And... Um, uh, he, he would go to the shul and wear a tallis and a yarmulke. Really? Yeah, he would, yeah. In fact, I, I left him at a certain point, and when I left him, he always took Jewish holidays off. He, he taught in school, he taught art, and he took off Jewish holidays. So when I left him, he still, my oldest boy was in college in Virginia at the time, he took off for the Jewish holidays, and then went to Virginia and went to the shul with, with my son. Huh. Now, your children were raised Jewish, right? Yeah, that, that, that was because my oldest son decided that's what he wanted to be, and the other two followed him. Um, you gave I, them a choice? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I figured, you know, we're different religions, and I always felt religion was a personal thing. So um, when I, I had, had my children... I was sending them the boys. Karen was too young at the time. I was sending the boys. They were um, uh, four and seven, something like that, uh, or five and seven. No, four and seven more. And um, I was sending them to vacation Bible schools, at uh, and they were attending this one time at the Methodist Church. And Dean comes home, comes home, and he says to me, Mother. When he said mother, he was serious. He said, mother, he says, I made a decision. I don't want to go to this church anymore. He says, I want to be Jewish. I want to go to Hebrew school and be bar mitzvahed. And I said, oh, okay. So my husband and I discussed it with him for a whole year to make sure this is what he wanted. At the end of the year, he still kept saying that. So we uh, joined the synagogue. This was in New Jersey. And uh, he went to Hebrew school. Now, the two younger ones followed him. He was, he, they idolized him. Whatever he did, they wanted to do. So uh, they decided they wanted to be Jewish too. Tradition is very important. That's family. I go to the synagogue practically every Saturday, not every Saturday, but practically. And of course, I, I observe the, the high holy days and everything, all the holidays. But uh, I don't keep a kosher house, and I'm not kosher. And I, I tell people, they say, well, what do you do when you eat this or that? I say, I say a baruch over it. You know? <laughs> so then it's okay. Did you have family in the Holocaust? No, not anybody that I knew, okay? I remember during the Second World War, the adults would sit off in a corner whispering that we think so-and-so is dead, you know, that type of thing. I didn't know what went on at that time with the Jews in Europe. I had no idea. It wasn't until after I was married, I think Dean was already born, my first child, and I, um, I read Diary of Anne Frank, and that was my first knowledge of what happened. And what did you, how did that change you? Did it change you? Oh, that's when I became more religious. Yeah. When I, when I started hearing all those stories, I felt my religion more. And it, it made it more important because... We have to live on. We have to live on. And not let that ever happen again. Tell me about your earliest memory. I was two years old, 
And I remember we lived in an apartment. They told me it was in North Philadelphia. That's all I know. And we lived, I remember living on the second floor. And a couple doors away was, I, as I remember, it must have been an Orthodox synagogue because the men all had long beards. And I loved going over there because they had an outhouse. And I thought that was very interesting. I didn't have an outhouse at home. You know, I had a regular bathroom. and um, uh, But they had an outhouse there. And it was, it was very exciting for me to, to go to the bathroom in the outhouse. <laughs> it was like an adventure. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. And hey. I assume they had an outhouse because they didn't have plumbing? Right. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all... How old were you areas. when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and what were, are your memories of that? I, I was six years old, and I remember, I remember the president coming on the radio and saying, t telling us what happened. It was uh, a very traumatic. I... I saw how worried everybody was, you know. I was only six years old, but it, it did affect me. And I would, they'd have air raids all the time. And I used to hide under the dining room table when they had an air raid, thinking that, oh, the Nazis are coming, they're bombing us, you know. And uh, I did things like that, you know. I, I, you know, of course, I, I, I saved newspapers, and we had a tin can drive, you know. And we did all that stuff for the war effort. I remember when I went to school, being in school, we had these air raid drills all the time, and we had to go sit out in the hall on the floor. There was one time that we had a block party down the street, and um, it was after my brother was born, my little brother. And all of a sudden, they had uh, an air raid drill. And... Uh, my mother, I was down there. It was it was already dark, but that time you could go out when it was dark. You didn't, you know, worry about your kids or anything. And uh, uh, my mother got upset. She had to leave my brother in the bathtub. She was giving him a bath at the time. She had to leave him in the tub. Well, she ran out to make sure I was all right and brought me to bring me home. And she, as she was running down the street, she was calling me, Arlene, Arlene. And I said, I'm coming. <laughs> So, you know, I knew I had to hurry up and get home. After the Second World War, uh, the supermarkets opened up. And there was a place called the Anacomy. And uh, my mother found out that everything was so much cheaper <laughs> in the supermarket. Before that, they used to go to the dairy store for all your dairy, the bakery for the bread, the 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 poultry store for your your chickens, you know, and and for your dairy stuff. There was another separate store, and she would go around to all the different stores when she went shopping, and then all of a sudden the Acme opened up, and she could get everything in that one store, you know. At plus the price was much cheaper, so uh, we didn't worry about. Be having kosher meat or anything like that at that time, okay? And they were never kosher after that. They're really rocking in Boston and Pittsburgh, PA. So, as a young girl, like uh, and through your through high school, what was the biggest event? What is the most memorable thing that happened in your life? Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, I went to. Um, uh, bandstand. It was before Dick Clark. They had two guys that were running it. And I did something I had never done before. I cut school for the day. I went with a bunch of girlfriends. And where we lived, where we went to school, and where the show was that you had to go to, you could not make it in time to get on bandstand. So I had to not go to school that day. I never told my mother that. And uh, I told her we were going to be on bandstand. That's all I told her, you know, and she looked for me on bandstand. And as far as I know, she never put together that I had to quit, 
not go to school that day. <laughs> So that was all live TV then, there wasn't That's taped right. or anything, did right. she see you? Yeah, yeah. She never put it together that I, you know, how did I get there so fast? Because it was way on the other side of town. It was in West Philly. Yeah. 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 Okay. When did you meet your husband-to-be and how did you meet him? Oh, that's an interesting story. Uh, he was an artist. He was in art school. He went to the Academy of Fine Arts. And he and some of his friends used to come to this dance class. I was a professional dancer, and it was a professional dance class. And they would come uh, there and sketch us. And I have one of his paintings of me in leotards in my bedroom. You can go in and look at any time you want. And... Um, uh, I didn't, there was a place, they had a lot of coffee houses around Center City, Philadelphia at that time. The Gilded Cage, the Artist Hut, you know, different, all different coffee houses that were really great. We were never drinkers, never would, you know, wanted to hang out in bars or anything like that. But we go to these coffee houses and they play classical music and um, they play chess and checkers. They had all this equipment there. And he walked in one night. He, he had had a beard, beard earlier, and I was never attracted by somebody that had a beard. So he walked in with it shaved off. And he walked in with another guy. And my girlfriend says, oh, I'd like to meet him. This was the other guy. And I said, you could have him. I said, I want the guy in the red shirt. So <laughs> I went over and introduced myself to him. And... Uh, uh, you know, that's how it was in the coffee house, you know? It, it, it was one big fa happy family. And Wasn't that considered forward for a woman back then? I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> you marched to the beat of your own drum then, huh? I sure did. Did that yeah. serve you well or ill as a young woman? Well. How did it serve you well? I did, I did <clears throat> everything I wanted to do within reason. I never went behind my parents' back for anything. And uh, they knew most of the time what I was doing and where I was going. I never had to hide thing, anything from them, except when I met my husband. I, <clears throat> he came to take me out. I introduced him as Lou Stein. <laughs> Lou Stein, yeah. huh? Because he was a Catholic Italian, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And if they saw, heard an Italian name, they... Yeah, oh, no, they didn't want me, you know, they had, they were not prejudiced in any way. You know, you could be friends with everyone. You know, that's how they always... But getting were. married, that's another story. That That's right. That was different. You don't get married, you know, to somebody like that. Well, um, anyway, they um, that started a real problem. And we had... This is a funny story. We, I had told you I had a lot of friends breaking out in show business, going to New York, you know, and we would go there and visit them. Well, uh, this one guy, and I mean, they were in shows like uh, Little Abner and, and things like that when I was going. And um, I, I met this girl on New Year's Eve at a party, and, she, and, when, and I started to become friendly with her. I thought she was much older. I was 21 at the time, and I thought she was about my age. And um, I was looking for somebody to come with us when we went to New York. I was going with my my soon-to-be husband, <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, I didn't, you know, want to go just with him. And I was a virgin when I got married. I, you know, I did a lot of dating and everything, but I never did, you know, had sex with any guy or anything. I was. I was always a virgin. I thought, oh, I'll become pregnant immediately, you know, and then my father will kick me out. <laughs> That's what I was worried about more than anything. And um, so anyway, I got this girl I mean to, I said, you know, we're going to New York and, you know, for a weekend, and would you like to go with us? And my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, had a car, you know, we could go. So um, she said, oh, good because I was planning to go because I'm a singer and I wanted to break into show business in New York. 
So I said, oh, okay. You know, I didn't think it, anything unusual at the time that, you know, she was going with us. So we went to go pick her up. She asked me, asked us to pick her up at the place where she was getting her hair done. And I walk in there and uh, I said, are you ready? And I said, where's your suitcase? And she said, over there in the corner. And I turned around and there were clothes and shoes from the floor to the ceiling piled up. I mean, like you couldn't believe. And he had a little coop, you know. <laughs> and, and I said, oh my God, you know. And I didn't realize she's taken everything with her. She was running away from home. She was only 16 years old. I didn't know this. And because uh, she told me she's going to New York to become a singer. And I believed her because I had so many friends that did the same thing, you know, and it was no big deal. So anyway, we go, to, we go to New York and then got there on Friday night and stayed in this friend's apartment. Jay, his name was Jay. And uh, Sunday morning, I was cooking my husband. Well, he wasn't my husband yet, but I was cooking him breakfast. I was making scrambled eggs when these two huge men come walking in. And they say, all they're saying is, where is she? Where is she? And we didn't know who the heck they were talking about. And she had a date with somebody that was in one of the soap, soap operas. <laughs> she was in the bathroom putting her makeup on. She was getting ready for her date. And she sees them through the mirror. And uh, I hear her yell, here I am, Dad. And I said, oh, Christ, what the heck is going on here? And she comes out, and she goes off with them. They still, I don't know if you ever heard the name Michael Callan. Uh, he, was, he was in um, Magnificent Seven, was one movie. He was in a lot of movies, but that was one I saw recently with him in it. Uh, anyway, he and Don Potter, Don Potter played Pappy Yoakum in Little Abner. They were in the apartment, they lived in the apartment right under from where we were staying. So uh, uh, she leaves with these two men. One was a, um, he wasn't a cop or anything, he was like a justice of the peace or something like that, you know, where he had some authority, and her father. And they go downstairs where her mother is waiting. And, um, her mother comes up to the apartment where I am, and uh, uh, they had said, your parents said if Eileen, Eileen was with you that it was okay and you can come home. But if she wasn't with you, if you were away from her, then don't bother to come home. You know, in other words, because they knew Lewis was going. They knew that, and because uh, I didn't hide anything, but... Uh, I, was, I said, I'm going with a girlfriend, you know, we'll be staying together in the room. So um, that was okay for them. And, um, and anyway, Eileen comes back at one point and, and they're saying, who's this Lou Ferracchio? And I look over at him and his, he's trying to eat his eggs very nonchalantly and he's shaking like a leaf. Because <laughs> we, we, you know, this was... We didn't know what to do with this. So um, uh, anyway, she comes back at one point from downstairs and uh, tells Lewis to get out of here. They're looking for you. They could could have arrested him for the Man Act. You know. What the Man Act? Yeah, the Man where you take yeah, a yeah. minor into another state. Yeah. Which is what we did with her. But you have to have sex or something, don't you? No, you don't no. have to. Have, no. Now, at that time, you take somebody over the state line that's a minor. <laughs> so, so he ran out, she, you know, because she told him to leave. And I was going back with them, okay? I wasn't going back with Lewis. But um, we had to start carrying all her clothes that she had brought with. And she must have had 25 pairs of shoes, you know, and we're carrying them in. Some, we dropped them at one point, and Jay, who was rehearsing for Little Abner at the time across the street in the rehearsal, comes running across the street, 
and says, what's going on here? I said, I'll tell you about it later. Because <laughs> yeah. I had the detective, whoever that guy was, you know, walking with me. So um, we got back. But what happened, that's how they found out he was Italian. Because they found out he lived at 19th McKean in Philadelphia. You had to be Italian to live at 19th McKean. South Philly, right? Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, look. I finally said to him, look, I said, I can't keep going behind my parents' back. I'm very uncomfortable with that. So we're, we're either going to have to break up or get married. And he said, okay, we'll get married. <laughs> very nonchalantly. So I said, all right. So he made all the arrangements. We went to Elkton, Maryland. You went to Elkton? Yeah. <laughs> Got oh married. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because we didn't want it in the Philadelphia newspaper. You know how they would put... But yeah, Elkins, where they all went to World War II to get married. I yeah, think. because you could get married real fast there. You didn't need to take a blood test or anything. Uh, so that was, that was an easy way to go. So um, anyway, that's, that's what we did. And uh, I had everything packed up in suitcases so that when I would come back to get my stuff, we would get out of there real fast. You know, I had it all set up where we were going to, because I knew how my father was going to react. So we come back to my house, my parents' house, and for some reason, I either knocked at the door, rang the bell or something. My sister, who was 13 at the time, <laughs> answers the door. She was, well, she was eight years younger than me, so, and I was 21. So, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, I just went like this. And she saw the ring, and she, oh, and she ran up and locked herself in the bedroom. She knew what was going to happen, the explosion that was going to take place. So I walk in with Lewis, and we had three guys with us to help me grab the stuff to move out real fast. Never got that far. My father jumped up and ran and said, get your stuff and get out. And I thought, oh, God, I'm getting off easy, you know? So I ran down to the basement to grab the suitcases that I had already, you know, packed and everything. And I come up the steps, and he, by the time I got to the top of the steps, he grabbed the suitcases out of my hands and threw them and said, you can't have anything, just leave. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm going with Lewis grabs my arm, and we're heading for the door. And meanwhile, my mother is on the phone calling all the relatives, crying, hysterically, Arlene just got married, come over right away. Everybody was coming over because I got married. Of course, you know your relatives lived in the neighborhood? Yeah, I lived in Philadelphia, not close by. I had one that was a doctor, and he had to come over and give my father a, an injection to calm him down because he was, it was unbelievable. So uh, Lewis and I make it to the front door, and I have his hand like this, and my father grabs my other hand, and he's pulling me the other way. You are not leaving this house. You're staying. I was 21, you know. Wasn't like I was a little kid. And you are staying right here. And uh, uh, Lewis, is, meanwhile, is pulling me with the other hand out the door. And I, I look outside, and I see all the porch lights. This is at night. Go on with all the neighbors. They heard all the screaming and everything. And one neighbor next door to my parents' house came and um, got me, and the other neighbor on the other side got Lewis. So we were separated. You know, they put each one of us in their house. <laughs> and uh, the one kept, I finally found out where Lewis was, and I went over to that house. And the guy there, Al, his name was Al Oslander, I'll never forget him. And he kept going back, checking in my house what the situation was. It, it, you know, they thought he's going to get over it, that he's going to get over it and he's going to let me back in and, every, you know, everything will be wonderful. Never happened. Never? N well, not at that time. Okay. And so we finally left, you know, and um, Lewis had a studio in Center City, Philadelphia, and we went there. And... Um, we went to his <coughs> his mother's house first, and uh, we told them, his parents, and they took it very well. Well, she thought I was going to convert to Catholicism. 
I had no plans of converting or anything, but she just thought I would. But she, they took it very well, you know. They, they're going to be real nice, so I'll convert. And uh, um, I got along with her very well, actually. Well, what happened with your father eventually? Uh, well, what happened was I became pregnant. Cause wait, I, wait. Months go by. Yeah. Well, it wasn't even months. It was, uh, yeah, I guess it was months because uh, I become uh, pregnant and I'm going to the hospital. And, uh, well, I, Dean was born 10 months after I was married. So it was some months, you know. And, uh, and your father didn't speak to you that whole time? My mother would sneak over to see me with the shopping bag full of care bag packages with the whole chicken in there and everything. <laughs> She would take the trolley car to come see me. And you were down in South Philly. In South Philadelphia, in Center City, um, Society Hill. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's where I was living, uh, on 6th, 6th Street, 6th. So anyway, um, my father and mother come to the hospital to see me the day when Dean was born. And they make they were on their way to go shopping to make the... Uh, um, Pigna Ben, you know what the Pigna Ben is? It was when the first Jewish boy is born. They're making the big party <laughs> for for their grand new grandson, you know. Oh. Yeah, so they came to the hospital to see me to say we're on our way to go shopping. My father was there, and he came over and he kissed me on my forehead. I'll never forget that, you know. So, still, I couldn't talk to him. I could be in the same room with him and could not talk to him at all because of the way he acted, you know. You just didn't feel comfortable or you weren't allowed? No, I didn't feel comfortable. No, I, I was definitely allowed because once I be, I had the baby, he was ready to take us back. Back, yeah. <laughs> and that's when they got to know Lewis and they saw he was really a nice guy, you know, so it wasn't that bad. <laughs> And uh, Dean was extremely precocious. That's Dean up there. He's there, up there, his bar mitzvah picture, and oh, that's yeah. him. He was painting at 18 months up there with, in front of the easel. And um, he, he kept, when I'd come over with the kids, with, well, it was just Dean at the time, um, Dean would go to him. He would crawl over to him. Like he knew that was the one I had to win over. That's what everybody said. They couldn't believe it, how he did it. And uh, um, my father finally broke down. And, you know, he, lo he loved his grandson. Oh, my God. Yeah, he might, went crazy for them. So at that point, your father accepts your husband. Right. But there's still the question. I'm not, still not talking to him. I'm not talking to him. I mean, I could be in the same room with him. I let him see the kids and everything. Well, afterwards, Craig was born, like three, uh, two years later. And um, uh, he, he, you know, he would come and pick them up and take them to his house for the weekend. He always wanted to take them to his house for the weekend, you know. He was so, just so proud of them. He loved them. Well, I guess what I'm getting at at a certain point, the question of what religion is he going to be, the bris, no. all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, he had a bris, but I also had him circ uh, christened in the Catholic Church. <laughs> I, w oh, I was really? Just, oh, yeah, I wanted to cover everything, you know. This is my first child. I wanted to make sure he was going to be all right. <laughs> so, so I had... You covered all your bases. That's right. So, anyway... Um, uh, but my father would take him with him. So this uh, one time he was he had to do business in this little town right near where I lived in Jersey. I was living in Jersey by then, and um, he wanted to. Uh, um, he called me up on the phone. It was the first time he had ever called me on the phone because he wanted to come over and take at least one of the boys home with him you know, for the weekend, like. And so I had to answer 
when he called, I didn't know it was him, you know. <laughs> that was how I, I fi it finally broke. I finally spoke to him. And how long, how much time went by before that happened? Before, I mean, between that incident, the night of the wedding, and that moment on the phone when oh, you talked to him. How, oh. Was that like two or three years? Uh, yeah, had to be. It had to be tough for you. No, it's not tough. I, I, I adjust very easily to things. And uh, I just, you know, I, I, I'd be right in the same room with him. And nobody even knew I wasn't talking to him. Nobody even knew it. I don't even know if he knew it. <laughs> yeah, I talked to my mother all the time, you know, but. I didn't. I well, couldn't. didn't it drive your mother crazy? No, I don't think she, she didn't care. She, I don't think she realized. She didn't realize you weren't talking to her husband, That's your right. father. That's right. I play very good. I tell you. <laughs> they never. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. 